All right, today I'm going to talk to you about the subject of grace. This is actually the first uh, sermon I ever recorded way back um, May the 3rd, 2009. Um, did a subject on grace. The first recorded sermon I ever did. You can see here's the notes for it right there. I mean, it goes back so far, we didn't even have computers back then. You see, it's all handwritten. Just joking. Okay, I just, you know, first started out, I was writing out my notes by hand and things and using a concordance and things. I didn't use a computer very much back in the old days. Uh, got into it more as time went by, but I still do some, some of my sermon notes and things like that by hand. Good thing to keep penmanship as part of your uh, skill set. But anyways, um, way back in 2009, I did this study on grace, and I have a whole stack of... Uh, sermon notes here that I'm going to be redoing as time goes by that never became, they were never videos, they were just audio from way back when we had our house church, Bible Believers Fellowship, and uh, we did sermon audio a lot, and of course we just were doing audio back then, but I had a suggestion that maybe I should redo some of those old audio sermons, kind of update them, and uh, see if anything is going to change or change, you know, and... Uh, from the time I wrote the notes to 2009 to today, 2017. So I'm going to be preaching them just as they are. I, I did not, I'm not going to listen to any of these old studies first and then try to imitate it or something like that. I'm just going to go through the notes and, you know, I don't even remember what arguments I was coming up with or whatever things. So we're going to go through it. The word grace appears 166 times in the Bible. Let's go to the first time it appears. Genesis chapter 6. Who was the first one to find grace? And of course, you could make the argument that uh, obviously Adam and Eve, you know, God had some grace there. And if you want to know what the best definition, the shortest and best definition for grace is unmerited favor, is what I would say. Now you can debate that again back and forth. But grace really is you getting something that you don't deserve. And um, God said that uh, you're going to die if you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he didn't kill them, at least not right away. They lost that immortal state, obviously, but uh, he didn't kill them right away. Let them live for quite some time after the fall there in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve, I'm talking about. God had some grace there. Uh, God's grace is present in any dispensation all throughout the Bible. God always has grace. But the, let's see here, Genesis chapter 6, verse 8 says here, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So you see it there that Noah found grace in God's sight. Why? Well, because all the people were doing wickedly, and Noah was not doing according to the, what was popular, the trends of his day. Um, verse 9 Genesis chapter 6, verse 9. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. All right, so you see some things there. All right, you see three things. He was a just man. All right, he had, he was honest, he was upright, he was righteous. And secondly, he was perfect in his generations. He hadn't messed around with strange flesh, in other words. Thirdly, Noah walked with God. Now, how do you walk with God? Go to Proverbs chapter 3. The book of Proverbs chapter 3. Now, I'm sure if you listen to this study in the one I did way back in 2009, you're going to hear some differences. And I'm going to be saying some things, you know, adding to the original autograph here, you know. Uh, a little sarcasm there, but uh, people don't get that anyhow. But um, Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 through 6, my enemies, I'm saying, my friends of the ministry, you know, other Bible believing Christians, yeah, you, you understand what I'm saying. Making fun of the original autographs thing. People put so much weight on that stuff, you know, the originals, the original autographs of Scripture and stuff. So I poke fun at some of that stuff, it's ridiculous. Uh, Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. 
Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. How do you walk with God? Trust the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. Well, I feel that you should say things differently. What does the Bible say? Do you trust the Lord? Do you have His Word? All these people that come out you know, and attack the King James Bible and attack those that stand for the King James Bible, and yet they'll call themselves Bible-believing Christians. They're not Bible-believing Christians. Unless you can show me and hold up a Bible and say, this is a perfect standard right here, you're not a Bible believer. Very simple. They don't trust the Lord. I mean, God can create the universe in six days, rest the seventh. God keeps everything going, the solar system and the sun and the moon and the seasons and the weather and the everything. He just takes control of all of it. But he's so inept that he can't give us a book, a written book that's perfect. It's a weird God you got there, if you're one of these new version people. Kind of a weird thing. I trust the Lord with my heart, all thine heart. Why? Because he wrote me. Wrote me a nice big letter. You see? 66 chapters or 66 books actually, excuse me, a lot more chapters than that, 66 books. It's a good letter. Tells me all about what he has planned, what he's done in the past, what he's doing now, what he's doing in the future, how I can go to heaven when I die. I trust in the Lord with all my heart. That's how you walk with God. Lean not unto thine own understanding. Understand that as a sinner, as a fallen creature, you say, I'm not smart enough to correct this book. I'm not smart enough to exalt my opinions and my feelings above the authority of God's written word. That's how you walk with God. Don't tell me you can walk with God and not be a Bible-believing Christian and say, God reveals things to me and I feel things. And then you look at the stuff that these people feel and it contradicts the scriptures. They're not walking with God. Unless it's the God of this world and they do walk with Him. In all thy ways acknowledge Him. Do you give God glory? In all thy ways acknowledge Him. And He shall direct thy paths. You'll walk with Him. You see. Interesting. But look at chapter 4, verse 12. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 12. When thou goest, thy steps shall not be straightened. And when thou runnest, thou shalt not, shalt not stumble. It's funny because the uh, NIV changes Proverbs chapter 3, um, verse 6. And uh, I forget how it goes exactly, but it says, instead of direct thy paths, it says, he'll make your path straight. But that contradicts chapter 4, verse 12. Thy steps shall not be straightened. You see, these new versionists, they come out and they try to give you a more accurate translation. And they don't even realize it half the time. But when they're operating without the power of the Holy Spirit... They're contradicting themselves. You know, I mean, it's so funny to me because these guys come out and they'll say, well, we're going to give you a better translation than they could have in 1611. And the 1611 was put out by, you know, Calvinistic Puritans and, and Church of England, you know, basically Anglicans. And they say, so you can't trust the translation. And yet you read the King James translation and everything ties together and in fact goes against the Anglican system and goes against the Calvinistic Puritan system. So they're not putting their own thoughts and their own feelings into the King James Bible. Those translators that were there, they were translating it accurately and the Lord led them to do it. These new versionists, they try to come in, they try to make it clearer and better, easier to understand, and they contradict themselves the whole way through it. They'll change a verse here and go, there, that's clear. And you go, okay, but if you read this verse over here, it contradicts what you just wrote. You know, it's really funny. When you study these new versions and you look at what verses they've uh, updated, you know, I mean, just, just forget the different Greek text, the Nestle's text versus the Receptus and, and the, you know, even some of the stuff in the Old Testament, the Masoretic Hebrew versus the Stuttgartensia, the whole thing there. Just forget all the manuscript stuff for a minute. 
Just look at, compare scriptures with scriptures. These people, when they update verses in their new versions, they'll cause confusion and contradiction throughout the rest of the Bible. You know why? Because they're not work, walking with God. They don't walk with God. Let's look at another man that walked with God. Go back to Genesis 5. Genesis chapter 5, verse 22. It says here, And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years, and he begat sons and daughters. Now that's like, you talk about a world record. Walking with God for 300 years. You know, I mean, it, it boggles your mind when you think about this, and it's like, you know, I think about stuff in my own life, and I'm just like, man, there's very little time, you know, to... You buy, you know, something and, you know, like with what we're going through right now, I buy land and it's like, I'd like to build on there. And I'm going, oh man, I don't want to build that way because I'd take too long. And, you know, I'd, I'd really love to, you know, whatever. But I got like, let's just say I live to be a hundred, which the Lord's going to be, you know, catching the body of Christ out of here and the whole thing's going to wrap up. Um, you know, church age and all that stuff, the time of Jacob's trouble. And we're going to be in the millennial kingdom, I believe, in a hundred years from now. But let's just say, for sake of argument, I'm 42 years old right now. Let's just say I live to be 100 years old, which is pretty rare nowadays. When you look at the vast majority of people, there aren't that many that make it to 100. But let's just say I make it to 100 years. Okay, that gives me, what, 58 years left? You know, that's not much time. But you get these guys back here pre-flood, and they're living like, you know, 900 plus years. And I think to myself... You know, 100 years is just like, you know, I mean, that's just, that's nothing. That's like, you know, a tenth, essentially. You know, we'll say it this way, a ninth of, of the life that these people are living. What could you get accomplished in 900 plus years? It's really something. But here you had Enoch, and he walked with God for 300 years. I mean, I, can you even fathom that? I mean, just stop and think about that for a minute, you know? And, and the temptations that will come upon you as a Christian sometimes, and you just go like, oh, Lord, I don't know how much more of this I can take, you know. And it's just like, and Enoch was there before the flood, so, you know, I don't, maybe it wasn't really, really, really horrible, like it wasn't Noah's day, but, you know, it's like he was still seeing some of that, that evil and wickedness and whatever else. I mean, you got people that are walking around 900 years of sin. That's pretty incredible. But let's continue. Here's some interesting things about Enoch. Verse 23. And all the days of Enoch were 365 years. I think that's interesting because a Jewish calendar does not have 365 days in it. But a Gentile calendar does. Hmm. Interesting. And Enoch walked with God, verse 24, and he was not for God took him. And of course you understand that Enoch was caught away before God's wrath and judgment came down on the earth. It's a beautiful picture of how the bride of Christ, the body of Christ, is caught up before God's judgment comes down. Noah is there, but he goes through the judgment. God preserves him through the flood. Enoch is caught out before the flood. Kind of an interesting thing. A very interesting picture of uh, Christians being like Enoch. They please God. They walk with God. God takes them, and Jews, in the time of Jacob's trouble, being like Noah, and they're taken through it, but preserved. Very interesting thing there. Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, verses 37 through 39. It says here, But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and, mar marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. All right. Uh, as we are rapidly approaching the time of Jacob's trouble, we're going to see more and more wickedness and things like Noah saw in his day. And, you know, I saw this thing, you know, the, these, 
these Mandela effect funny bunnies, you know, we entered the whole thing. It was, it's a witch, uh, Fiona Broom, that brought this whole Mandela effect thing out. It's a spell that people fall under and they say, don't you remember the Bible used to say such and such? And they'll put that in through power of suggestion. And they just keep saying, it, remember it? It said that. It said the lion and the lamb. But now it says the lamb and the wolf. Oh, you know, oh. And, and they play on this thing. They'll just repeat this. And they get people start going, well, maybe it did say, oh, you know, and stuff like this. And I saw somebody said, one of the comments, they said that it's obviously that's been changed. It says Noe, but the name is Noah. You know, and it's like, uh, okay, uh, the New Testament was written in Greek and is coming into English. The Old Testament is written in Hebrew and coming into English. So the Hebrew word coming into English is Noah. Greek word coming into English is Noe. King James translators were being honest. They were being, they're saying we're just taking it right from Hebrew into English, Greek into English. All right. There's no Mandela effect changed in it. The King James Bibles, you know, a hundred years ago used to say, before CERN or something like this, used to say Noah. And mysteriously, magically, the, the CERN waves came down and changed it to Noe, you know. <laughs> People are so gullible, you know, these Mandela effect dumb bunnies. But, you know, again, we're seeing this tie in here. The only people that are going to be, you know, or I should say it this way, uh, what's important right now for a Christian? What's important? To walk with God. Why? So that you can find grace in God's sight. You know, I'm going to tell you right now, all the stuff that's going on, the cataclysmic type of stuff, the flooding, the hurricanes, the earthquakes, the, the wildfires and everything else, we need God's grace. War, rumors of war. All the stuff that's happening right now, we need God's grace. We have to have God's grace. How do you get God's grace? By walking with God. Read Proverbs chapter 30, verses 5 through 6. Well, let's continue. Go back to Psalm 84. Psalm 84, verse 11 through 12. It says here, For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man that trusteth in thee. Hmm. I mean... All the terrorism that's going on and, and the, all the natural disasters and all this other stuff and everything else. Do you trust God to get you through it? Do you trust God to protect you? And you know, oh sure brother Brian, was well, it stuff hit your area yet? You know, <laughs> I mean, it's easy just to go, yeah, when you got food in your stomach and clothes on your back and you're sitting there in front of your computer and everything's just kind of nice and whatever else. But, you know, I get stuff from brethren all the time. And it's just like all of a sudden, um, you know, I'll just, just going to give a name, a brother, a friend of the ministry here, and as you can, just to request prayer for him, uh, Brother Jeremy Clark, Eternal Redemption Channel. And uh, there's a chance he's going to be losing his job. And he's just like, I don't know what to do, brother. I know. <laughs> it, it gets weird at times, you know, and you say, do you trust the Lord? And, you, and you're like, yeah, I do. But, you know, it's like, I'm like, you know, <laughs> it's like you're on a train. It's like the, the brakes are out and the bridge is, is going up front. And you're going, uh, okay, Lord, you know, I'm going to be crashing here soon. What do you got planned? You know, can you kind of make things happen? Mm -hmm. You'll go through those times as a Christian. I've gone through those times. The Lord will test you. He'll allow you to be tempted but he'll make a way to escape that temptation by the way but those times are going to come into your life why um first of all his grace is there to provide for you but he wants to see if you uh he wants to give you a blessing if you trust in him so please you know if you're out there please pray for brother jeremy um you know as he's i mean possibly losing his job just pray for the lord's will there 
I know I've, there's been times I've I've uh, lost jobs and things like that, and, and it turned out later on to be the greatest blessing. But boy, it's hard to see that at times. And I mean, you know, I I'm in contact with a lot of people, and there's a lot of you that are struggling hard. You got things that you're going through and, and stuff, and it's just like, oh, Lord, I don't know what's going on here. But you got to learn to trust Him. Interesting. Uh, next, we're going to look at um, some other verses here quickly. The thing of uh, Paul. Um, it's interesting because all of the Pauline epistles, every single one of them begins and ends with grace. Let me show you. Go to Romans. Unmerited favor that comes from God. Romans chapter 1 kind of gives a little bit of an introduction, but he goes down to verse 7 there. It says, To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace come from God to the body of Christ. Unless, of course, you're a posty-toasty, post-tribber, because then you believe that uh, peace actually is taken away from God. According to Revelation chapter 6, peace is taken from the earth by the same one who promised to give you peace. It's kind of an issue. Go back to Romans. Go back to the end of the book of Romans. And we'll see here it ends with grace. Okay, verse 24. Romans chapter 16, verse 24. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. The unmerited favor of the Lord is with you as a Christian. You know, uh, there, I, you know, I, again, I write back and forth with the brother, you know, who you are. And, you know, he's like, you know, I've gone through, I'm going through some things and it's like I mess up and I sin and I think, okay, I feel separated from God, but is this really the chastening of the Lord? Is it, I mean, it could be a lot worse. Am I saved? Am I, I, you know, and you get these questions in your mind because you sometimes, you know, it's just like the Lord lets you get away with something, you know, and you're going like, okay, you know, uh, you know, did you chase me, Lord? I, you know, <laughs> and stuff, you know, yeah, you know what it is? God's grace. Sometimes the Lord looks at your situation and he says, yeah, I understand why you messed up. I mean, remember, again, all sin is self-destructive. The wages of sin is death. All sin leads to your premature death, to your hurt. There's nothing that you can do that's called sin in the Bible that's going to be positive for you. So sin is actually self-punishing. But, but, don't think that, well, they're not cool. I can just sin and whatever else, that grace may abound. No, no, it doesn't work that way. Because there are times God's going to correct you and He's going to punish you. As a good father does his children, He's going to chastise you. He's going to give you a little bit of a weapon. But there are times when the Lord looks at that situation and He says, Okay, you're going to get a weapon, but it's not going to be that bad. Because I see this happen or I see that happen. I mean, you know, again, we are living in the most uh, toxic, polluted world that there is right now. And you got to keep that in mind sometimes, brethren. I mean... Yes, you should be self-judging. If we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Yes, you know you need to you need to be convicted over sin, and you need to say, "I got to turn from this sin." You know, I got Lord, please help me to get victory over this sin. That's there, absolutely. But remember, we are living in a time of spiritual wickedness that I think is only equaled before the flood, as the Bible says. You know, we're in the days of Noah again. But I think this time we have the, the poison of technology, you know, where you can get out in the most remote area and you'll feel better than you would in the city. And because of there's no Wi-Fi out there or whatever else, but you're still going to get hit by all different types of electronic frequency and things like that. And don't tell me that that stuff doesn't affect you. It does. So, and you know, you, I mean, there's a video online. I've, I can't, I'm not going to give a link to it. Maybe one of you can in the comments section, but there was some atheistic, uh, scientist or something and he was talking about how that we can transmit frequencies and things that'll change the minds of fundamental christians and things like this fundamentalists you know we can we can affect their brains and and they have certain uh chemicals within their mind and their brain is you know 
formed a certain way and we can essentially get rid of that you know and stuff and maybe have vaccinations or or things i mean this sounds crazy but it's out there you know it is i mean they it's there and there have been plenty of experiments and things like that where they've used tried to use radio frequency to mess up people's minds uh, a good example another thing here not meaning to go off on a tangent but just got to say this and that is there were there was some embassy in russia uh, many years ago and the people that were there the americans that were there stationed there came home and they had all kinds of weird mental stuff going on and um, a lot of them suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder and, and they had all kinds of really weird stuff that happened to their heads and they were like yeah the, you know basically came out and saying that yeah the russians were experimenting with electrofrequency to mess up their minds it is there so as a christian living in this cesspool world that we are in right now we're going to get hit with stuff that people 200 years ago didn't know anything about right um even 100 years ago i mean i remember i don't have the book here with me right now because it's it's in storage these are just the essential books for the ministry but there's a, a African explorer, well, he was an explorer from England that went to Africa with the Royal Geographical Society back right around Livingston, David Livingston's time. And his name was uh, Sir Richard Francis Burton. Not the movie actor Richard Burton, but this guy was around, you know, probably 100 years before him. And Richard Burton, he's the guy that ended up translating the Kama Sutra and the Kama Shastra and the Perfumed Garden, the Oriental Sex Manuals. Um, I've studied a lot of really odd stuff. I was really into African exploration way back, you know, years ago. <laughs> but anyways, um, but this this guy, um, Richard Burton, um, what point was I going to make? <laughs> uh, I was going to say something about that. It'll come back here in a minute. But the whole point is... Um, I cannot think of what I was going to say about that guy. I don't remember. Oh, uh, nuts. I hate it when that happens. If I remember, I'll say it again. But, you know, um, you know, he was a very brilliant man. I'll just, I'll say that. Uh, he could speak like 40 different languages and things. Um, very, very, very intelligent man. And, uh, you know, lived at a time when there was really no pollution and things like that of, oh, I know what it was. I know what it was. Excuse me. Okay. Thank you, Lord, for bringing it back. He, when he first came out with these Oriental sex manuals that are now, you know, I mean, I've heard of Christian, professing Christian couples that'll read this stuff on um, his Oriental sex man, manuals and things. And when he first came out with it, he had to bring it out in Latin. Because if he would have brought it out in English and published it over in England, he would have gone to prison for it. This is, you know, 1850, 1860, somewhere in there. Maybe even a little bit later than then. I mean, it's, you know, documented history. A lot of this early pornographic type of stuff, you know, uh, it was just in writing, first of all. They didn't have, uh, you know, the Oriental, old Oriental sex manuals and stuff. They would, you know, paint things and whatever else. But the pornographic world that we have today, they couldn't have even fathomed it back then. Even the most wicked people back then could not fathom the level of depravity that is now prevalent in our world today. So again, as Christians living in this time period, God's going to have a lot more grace for you. God's going to look down and He's going to say, Hey, that sin is self-destruction, self-destructive child, uh, son, daughter, but I understand why the temptation is that much greater. I understand what you're going through. It's a terrible, terrible thing. I mean, the eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil and the good. He knows what's going on. So just a little bit of an encouragement there. But uh, three things here. Ephesians chapter 2, 8, and 9. The famous Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 about grace. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You know, it's kind of funny 
when you think about this, again, what's the definition of grace? Unmerited favor. God is doing something for you that you don't deserve. Why? Because it is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Do sinners deserve to go to heaven when they die? Absolutely not. Did a study a while back on Jeffrey Dahmer, a cannibal, sodomite cannibal. And you read his testimony and stuff. I did a whole study on it and things. He was saved. That guy got saved in prison after he got caught for doing all this vile, horrible, wicked stuff. Killed 17 young men and ate a lot of them and stuff like that. I mean, just sick, disgusting, twisted. But God had grace. Unmerited favor. Dahmer comes to him and says, God, please save me. I'm a wicked sinner. I deserve to go to hell. You'd be completely justified sending me to hell. Please save me. Unmerited favor. God has grace for him. But you get these people in their pride and they say, I don't have to come that way. There's no repentance there. I don't have to repent of sin to be saved. I reject that. I just say, I'm just going to come. I'm going to take salvation from God. I'm just going to say, I just I believe it. It's mine. They're going to take it. How does grace come into that? Unmerited favor. Why should there be unmerited favor there? Why does grace, God have to have grace for somebody that just comes and says, I'm just going to take it? No, God's grace is there because you're a sinner. Because you've messed up your life and you get to the point where you realize, I'm not getting into heaven. There is no possible way I'm getting into heaven with this mess of a life. I'm not going to make it. You know? I mean... I don't know if you've ever had that bad of an experience or whatever else. I, again, I'll just tell you a little story here. Uh, about two days ago, I guess, yeah, two days ago now, um, I had to go to a, there's a Lowe's up above us here, north of us here. And myself, my wife, and my son, we went up to get some some building supplies and things. And I'm driving. And, and I'm like, man, the brakes feel a little bit soft. And I thought, well, you know, uh, just got this truck about two weeks ago bought a used truck and things. I haven't had a truck in a while. Bought, uh, well, a couple months, I'm saying, but bought this truck. I'm like, man, the brakes feel kind of soft. And uh, bought it as is. There's no warranty or anything. I don't buy new vehicles. And so I'm driving and I'm like, you know, it's really starting to get soft. And all of a sudden this little warning thing comes up on the dashboard, you know, service uh, brakes soon. And a little alarm starts to go off. And I'm going, oh boy. <laughs> And I'm pulling a trailer and I'm just like, okay, this is bad. So pull into the parking lot at Lowe's, you know, limp the truck there, pull into the parking lot. And I'm just like, get underneath and there's brake fluid all over the place. And I'm just going like, oh man. And I'm thinking, I'm not going to make it. I didn't look at that thing and say, you know what? That's not a big deal. I'm fine. Everything's fine. Everything's going to work out just fine. I looked at that thing and I said, I'm in trouble. I'm in serious trouble. I can't keep limping this truck along the way it is. I have a problem that needs to be fixed. Good picture of salvation. You see, these people, they go along and they see the leak, the brake leak in the system. And they say, well, it's not that bad. I mean, I've seen worse things. I mean, hey, at least the motor's not ruined. Hey, at least the transmission's not going out. I can still go along like this. I can still just, you know, drive it around and I'll just kind of shift down and downshift and try to creep my way up to stoplights and things like this. That's not that big of a deal. Because in their pride, they don't want to ask somebody for help. I had to ask for help. Not always the funnest thing to do when you're, you know, a man and things and, you know, but I had to, I needed help. You see? I came to a place as a sinner where I realized I'm not making it. I'm going to fall short here. I'm not going to make it into heaven on my good works and my good life and I'm not that bad of a person. I have a serious problem here. And I came to the Lord and I said, God, I can't make it. I'm not going to make it. Would you have enough grace for me? Unmerited favor for me? Would you have enough grace for me to save me, please? 
You see? That's salvation. So we're saved by grace. What's another thing? God gives it to humble people. Go to James. James chapter 4. Verse 6. Actually, we'll start in verse 5. Do ye think that the Scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? You know, what a terrible thing to say about people. The spirit that's in you as a lost person is no good. Well, I'm not that bad. The Bible says you are bad. The spirit that's in you lusteth to envy. You're not content. You have to be better. You have to have something better. You have to think that you're great. In your self-righteous pride, you can't come low and say, Hey, you know what? I'm useless. I'm a sinner. The Spirit that's in you is no good. You better replace it with the Holy Spirit. Verse 6, But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Hmm. God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. You know, the most humbling experience is when you realize you have a problem and your pride is abased. You're driving, you're cool in your vehicle and everything else. You know, you're driving around. I got things worked out, going to get some construction materials. Yeah, that's right. Brake pedal just went to the floor. Bing, 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 bing. Warning light comes on and you go, uh-oh. Um, uh, uh, all of a sudden you're not so cool anymore. All of a sudden you're looking pretty stupid. Okay. Your uh, fluid's blowing all over the place and things. It's leaving a big trail of brake fluid where you're going. When you push on the brakes, you know, you need help. You know what most people do when they come to that situation? Spiritually speaking, they'll patch it up and keep driving. Some sin comes out. They'll watch some video or they hear some sermon or they look down and they see some kind of track sitting there like that. And they look at that thing and they go, it's a gospel tract. Oh no, you know. What do they do? They patch it up. Well, I'm not that bad. Whoever put that down, they're a sinner too, you know. I mean, that, that preacher had no right to say that to me. That, that, that wasn't right. He, he said that thing and I'm, I'm mad at him and, and he, he shouldn't have said that. That, 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 you know, that, that's personal. Who is he to judge me anyhow? They're patching it up. They're patching up their problems. God resisteth that proud person. Self-righteous pride is going to damn every single person that goes to hell. It's because of self-righteous pride. Say it that way. Every single one of them. You don't go to heaven as, or excuse me, you don't go to hell as a humble person. Everybody that ever went, went there because of pride. What's the Bible say about Satan? He's a king over all the children of pride. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your, fa your father ye will do. Hmm. Pride. I don't need God. I don't need this salvation stuff. I'm not that bad. Things are okay. I'll just patch this up and be on my way. Yep, that's the way it works. First Peter chapter five. First Peter chapter five, verse five. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. This is talking about saved people. James chapter four there was talking about lost people. Now they're talking about saved people. You say, well, God has different standards, you know, because we can get saved and then we can just go on in our pride. And it's so funny because, you know, I, I'll hear these people and they say, I'm, you know, I had this, some wingnut Anderson follower and he said, he said, I'm a proud, his exact words, I'm a proud non-dispensationalist. Like, okay, do you realize what you're saying? <laughs> you know, for God resisteth the proud and giveth grace 
to the humble. Hmm. Interesting, isn't it? God will resist the proud, even if you're saved. You get to the point where God you know, shows you that you're prideful in some way. You better get that thing, you know, you better repent of it and uh, get it forgiven quickly. God, please forgive me for that. I've had to do that a couple times. More than a couple times. <laughs> you know, there have been times I've been very, very prideful. There have been times in my marriage I've been prideful. There have been times in my relationships with other Christians I've been very prideful. And I've had to, to swallow that pride sometimes and come back to that person, go to my wife sometimes and just say, you know what, I'm sorry. I've been struggling with pride on this issue. I will admit to that. And, you know, people say, oh, well, you know, you haven't admitted it. Well, because if your stands are wrong, I'm not going to submit to your stands. You know, I'm not going to change my beliefs on this King James Bible. This is God's perfect word. I'm not going to change my beliefs on repentance that leads to, you know, God's grace and faith coming down to save you. I'm not going to change that, repentance towards God and faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not going to change that. I'm not going to change my beliefs on the rapture, the timing of the rapture being before the time of Jacob's trouble. I'm not going to change on that. There's a whole lot of stuff I'm not going to change on. It doesn't make me prideful. It just makes me say, hey, I know what the Bible teaches and I'm not going to back down. But when you see these people and they are looking and, and they're wrong, they're clearly wrong, and they refuse, they're just, no, I'm a... And, and they'll actually use the term. It cracks me up. They'll say, I'm a proud post-tribber. I'm a proud user of the NIV. I'm a proud non-dispensationalist. Kind of a problem. Go back to Romans chapter 12. Grace is something that we need to have towards other people. I have just Romans chapter 12, so I guess my original sermon, I read the whole chapter. 21 verses. There's not that many. Let's go through these. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It's an interesting thing there. I was thinking about this, you know, uh, the verse that talks about they that are Christ have cru they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh. You know, and you don't think about that. And here it says about present your bodies a living sacrifice. And, you know, it's like we don't really think about the, the mental image of that, the, the picture of that. We think about how Jesus Christ suffered on the cross, and then it's like, wow, he really went through a lot. Uh, well, brethren, that same picture is given to us of how we should treat our flesh. You crucify it. It's, it's, a, it's a fighting thing. It's a, it's a thing. It's war, you know. It's, it's two men on a, on a field of combat with knives, and they're jumping at each other, lunging, trying to kill the other one. That's the picture of our spirit and our flesh. Your flesh says, hey, I want to I wanna watch that movie. Let's just click on that video. Come on, it's not a big deal. Let's listen to this music. Let's eat this kind of stuff that you know you shouldn't be eating. Let's whatever. Say the kind of things that you shouldn't be saying. That's the flesh. The Bible says that you're to present your body a living sacrifice. You're to kill that crucify it I mean what a picture you know the Christian it's supposed to be like a, your spirit is just there like just beating the living daylights out of the flesh flesh says uh, let's listen to that music no we're going to listen to hymns hey can, can I read this article no we're going to read the bible you know <laughs> uh, don't give that guy a tract over there spirit says give him a tract come on do it well, I, I got to get going. I'm, I'm going to be late here. I can't put a tractor. You put that tractor there or you're going to be in trouble. You know. What a thought. I'm thinking about that. That's, you know, thinking about that for another study, but I'll just put it in here. But uh, verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Nonconformity. Very, very important. Extremely important. I'm not going to say much more on that for sake of time, but verse 3. For I say through the grace, give it unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. 
For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. You'll see this theme presented throughout the New, the New Testament, the Pauline epistles, that we are one body. So these people, they'll say, where do you go to church? <laughs> How can I go to some place that I'm in all the time? You know, I like to reply back to them. You know, I say, uh, well, I'm actually in church seven days a week, 365 days a year. How about you? But uh, they don't usually answer that. Oh, I, I know what you mean, but, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. Uh, verse 6, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, God gives you not only grace to get saved, but He also gives you grace. He has grace, unmerited favor that He gives you gifts. Uh, very interesting here. Whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the pr proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. What is dissimulation? Dissimulation is basically fake hypocrisy. Okay? So you're not supposed to love people with dissimulation. Don't be a hypocrite with your love, in other words. You know? I'm going to talk more about that here in just a little bit, the thing of having grace for the brethren. Verse 10. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of saints, given to hospitality. Bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another, mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. So you want to know what you should be doing as a Christian right now. You know, a lot of us, again, you know, I, I remember somebody wrote in one of the comments, I thought it was so good, they said, I'm having one of those uh, wish it was the rapture day days. <laughs> you know, uh-huh, yeah. Uh, you're going to have those days where you just think to yourself, oh, Lord, can you please just catch me away for a You know, you don't even have to do the whole body of Christ. Just me, you know, just, just <laughs> take me home, please, you know. You're going to have those days. But you see, there's a purpose for you being here in this world. You're going through some rough thing. You're looking at losing your job. You're looking at having issues and things that you're struggling with, and you're struggling with some sickness. You have other problems. Uh, there's a reason why you're supposed to be here on this earth. You say, what's that reason, brother? Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 tells us what we're supposed to be doing with our time. Now, you don't have to do all those things. It's just describing the body of Christ and how that there's different gifts that God gives you according to His measure of grace. You can find something to do in that list. You can exhort a brother or a sister. You can, you know, uh, be kindly affectioned one toward another in honor preferring one another, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. You know, I mean, just go down through the list. And I will say this, uh, as time goes on, uh, things are def definitely getting a lot worse out there. And uh, the grace that God has for people is starting to fade. Uh, it's, it's really an interesting thought when you go out there in this world and, and it's just like you see such wickedness and things and you think to yourself, you know what, I'm literally looking at people that more than likely in a few years, these people are all going to be taking the mark of the beast. I mean, I'm standing, you know, I had to go to a garage to get my truck fixed just to kind of give you a little bit more of the story. And I'm standing there and this woman comes in, you know, and uh, she's in the waiting room and she's picking up her vehicle. And she comes in and, and uh, you know, the guy's saying, yeah, your car's ready, Mrs. Such and Such. And 
and everything else and, and it's going to be he gave her the amount that it's going to be and she goes okay and she looks down at the credit card machine thing there and she goes does it have a chip reader and I'm just like <laughs> you know does it have a chip reader and I'm thinking you know mark in the hand these people are so close to it you know and you know there, there's been times that I've you know you try to talk to people like that and they just look at you like you're from some other planet or something you know and it's just incredible how close we're getting to this whole thing happening and you know it used to be I mean you know, I did a study years ago on the thing of Thanksgiving and when America right around the Revolutionary War time period when they celebrated Thanksgiving it was actually a day of fasting not a day of indulgence not a day of eating and you know that you go back to some of the early founding fathers and there was issues there I'm not saying that there was no Masons or whatever else uh, there definitely were some issues with George Washington and a lot of the other founding fathers but these guys were calling for national days of prayer and fasting and they weren't going through the kind of stuff that Americans are going through right now but you get this concert shooting out there in Las Vegas you know here just the other day and this guy kills 59 people and like 500 something are wounded and it's just like where's the turning from sin where's the national repentance Hurricane Harvey hits Texas all kinds of people losing their homes where's the repentance other hurricanes there it's wiped out Puerto Rico they're having all kinds of problems and stuff and and uh, all these other islands just completely just wiped out Florida gets hit they're, they're having trouble and stuff where's the repentance where's the national repentance where's the country falling down on their knees and saying God please forgive us for our wickedness where's the desire to repeal the sodomite marriage laws and the transgender can use perverts can use whatever bathroom they want where is it what's going on uh, God's going to be resisting the proud Again, you know, I saw this thing, he's, people being interviewed and, and stuff, you know, and they, they said, uh, you know, this Hurricane Harvey thing. And uh, they, you know, I watched, I watched some of this stuff. There will be end times type ministries and they put together these little video clips of things that are significant to Bible prophecy being fulfilled. And uh, I remember this one and they were showing these people down in Texas and they were like, you know, what do you think after this, you know, hurricane and stuff? And they were all like, we got this. We're Texans. We're tough. We're proud. You know, and I'm just going, you people just don't get it, do you? Out west, burning just thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of acres of land burning. Here it's flooding. There it's, you know, mudslides. There's a volcano going to erupt and everything. And people are just going, we got it. We're good. We're good. We'll get through this. We got it. <laughs> God's grace is disappearing. That unmerited favor. I don't care when you lived or how good a person you are. Nobody has the respect of God. Okay? Nobody can say they're walking around on earth and God looks down and says, Well, everybody's sinners except for that person. <laughs> nope. Not going to happen. We need God's grace. And uh, that time of grace is going to be disappearing. And uh, this world is heading into the worst time period ever. I mean, you can see it. you got to be totally blind, uh, you know, willfully blind to not see what's coming. Um, war is just going to be so bad in the future. You know, a bunch of crazy people, and they, they're all just, like, itching to get into fights and things. And there's just, you know, all these different warring factions. And this person is going to fight with that person. This religion is going to fight that one. And the, this... It's just going to be terrible in this time period coming up. I'm glad I have God's grace. I'm glad I got to the point where my pride was broken and I said I can't save myself. And I needed God's grace. I pray that you find God's grace, that you search for God's grace. You say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. The pride has ended in my life. I'm not a good person. I have a problem. My brake line has ruptured. I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to be able to limp this thing along. I have a problem and I need to stop right now. I need to quit kidding myself and telling me 
tell myself that I can make it to heaven on my own good works. I need to stop right now. I need to come to God as a broken, broken sinner and say, God, I've messed my life up. And understand, God's word is against your sin. And you need to feel that personal conviction and say, you know what, I've sinned. I've taken my life that God has given me and I've done things wickedly with that life. I've done things wickedly with the earth that He's created. And I've spent all my life rejecting Jesus Christ, His precious gift that He gave to save man. And I've rejected that all my life. That's contrition, understanding I've not only messed up my life, but I've sinned against a holy, righteous God. I don't want this life anymore. I come to you, God, and ask you, I plead with you, please have grace for me. Please save me. I pray that you do that today.